That 70s show actor Danny Masterson has got 30 years in prison for aring women. Most allegations against Danny came to light in March 2017. It was confirmed that an investigation had begun into SA involving the actor. Danny was removed from the Netflix show The Ranch and was dropped by his talent agency. He was charged in 2020 with forcibly aring three women in separate incidents between 2001 and 2003. He pleaded not guilty to three charges in January 2021. All of the crimes are believed to have taken place in his home. He was initially tried for the allegations in late 2022, but this was a mistrial and he was retried. He's now been found guilty and has been sentenced to 30 years to life. So another body has been found in Lady Bird Lake. This is now the fourth man aged 30 to 40 pulled from the lake this year. And many people are claiming they can see patterns in the men being found in the lake, causing people to wonder if it's a serial killer. I just did a podcast episode breaking this all down, but here's some of what we know. So in 2018, these men were three of the six bodies recovered from bodies of water in downtown Austin. The police ruled that there was no foul play, but all three men were seen in the two popular bar areas in Austin, 6th Street and Rainey. And in an article from 2019, ER doctors were saying that they were seeing a lot of people coming in after being drugged in these two neighborhoods. And as of now, we know that three of the four men who died in Lady Bird Lake this year were seen in those two neighborhoods the night before. The other one is still inconclusive. If you have any information, you can contact the Austin Police Department, and if you know anyone in Austin or anyone traveling to Austin, you can let them know what's going on so that everyone can look out for each other. Can you imagine living with someone that you know is trying to end your life? This hidden camera captures a moment this woman puts bleach inside her husband's coffee maker multiple times a day. This is Robbie Johnson and he began setting up cameras all around his house when he started to notice that his coffee was tasting a little off. He wasn't really expecting to catch anything but when he looked back at the footage, he was shocked. His wife Melody is seen pouring a substance inside his coffee maker every single day before he brewed the coffee. Robbie got testing strips and each time it tested positive for chlorine. At this time, Robbie and Melody were in the process of a divorce, but they were still living together. Robbie pretended to drink his coffee every morning and continued to gather evidence so that he can go to police. But when he showed police all this footage, they said that they couldn't see exactly what Melody was pouring into the coffee maker, so he couldn't prove it. So Robbie had to set up even more cameras around the house with different angles so that it can prove that Melody was was in fact poisoning him. Melody was charged with attempted murder and I bet this guy will never let anyone else make him a coffee again. More information has been released recently about the killing of four university students at the University of Idaho, but the killer is still at large. On Sunday morning, four students were found stabbed to death in their beds near campus. Two other roommates were at home at the time upstairs, but both were unharmed. It's believed that their deaths occurred around three or four in the morning, though the 911 call was not placed until the following day. It's also now believed that they were asleep at the time of the attack. Initially, police believed that there was no further threat to the community, but they have since backtracked that. And as of now, they're looking for a K-Bar brand combat blade that they think was used in the attack. A live stream from a food truck actually shows Madison and Kaylee ordering food hours before the attack happened. In the video, this man can actually be seen behind the girls walking around and looking at them, leading many internet sleuths to believe that he was somehow involved, but he has since been cleared by the police. Police have also released this updated timeline of events showing that Xana and Ethan were at a party and Maddie and Kaylee were getting food that night. A lot of this information has actually been uncovered by Kaylee's sister who's taken a lot of the investigation into her own hands. And one thing that she wants people to know is that Kaylee called her ex-boyfriend six times that night an hour before the attack happened. Right now, we don't know if that means anything, but it is something that she wanted out there. Classes have not been canceled on campus, but if you choose to not go, you will not be penalized. And if anyone has any tips or information on this case, you can call a tip line at 208-883-7180. This is the Pitbull video, one of the hardest cartel execution videos to watch explained. The video that I'm about to explain is extremely graphic and I don't recommend searching for it. The video begins with a man lying on his back on the ground and two men are holding his legs open. He's being restrained. And in total, there is five perpetrators and one victim and also two pit bull dogs. Apparently, this is the victim's punishment for allegedly doing something with a kid or to a kid. The victim is naked, and at the start of the video, the dog has done most of the work. The dog already ripped off the man's privates, and it's just a bloody mess. 
The dog continues to rip pieces of flesh off of where his privates used to be, and the victim is being held down and he is also gagged so he can't scream. But sometimes the gag came loose and at this point you could hear the man scream in pain. The victim was even talking but I couldn't translate it but that means he was completely conscious during this. Which I can't even imagine the pain. As a man, this might be one of the worst videos out there. Funky Town is bad, Ghost Rider is bad, but as a man, I can't imagine anything more painful than a pit bull ripping off your junk while you're still alive. Not many people mention this video with the other disturbing ones, but it's definitely up there. There's not any information about the victim after the video. I don't know if he died, but it's safe to assume he did. He lost a lot of blood, and if a dog eats your privates, you will most likely get an infection and die from it. All in all, this video is very graphic, very real, and very disturbing. Please do yourself a favor and never go searching for this video, especially if you're a man. We all know about a school shooting, but have you ever heard about a school stabbing? On October 22, 2015, 21-year-old Anton London Peterson walked into a high school in Trollholt in Sweden with a sword and killed three people and injured another. Peterson entered the school at 10.06 a.m. wearing black clothing, a cape, a German World War II helmet, and a paintball mask that resembled Darth Vader. And at first, many people believed Peterson was just doing a Halloween prank dressed up as Darth Vader. But when 20-year-old teaching assistant Lavin Eskandar confronted Peterson, Peterson immediately stabbed him with a sword and Eskandar died at the scene. Peterson then stabbed 15-year-old student Hamed Hassan who died from his injuries later in the hospital. Peterson then stabbed another 15-year-old unnamed student who survived his injuries. And while Peterson was wandering through the halls of the school, two students encountered him, and believing his presence was a Halloween prank, they posed with him and took a picture. And this is that picture right here. And according to authorities, Peterson spared these two boys because they had white skin. Shortly after this, 42-year-old teacher Nazir Hamso confronted Peterson and demanded he remove the mask. Peterson then charged at him and stabbed him in the abdomen. He then died six weeks later in the hospital on December 3rd. Shortly before 10.16 a.m., police officers arrived at the scene, only 10 minutes after Peterson arrived at the school. Peterson reportedly charged at the police and he was shot in the abdomen, later dying from his injuries in the hospital. It was also revealed that before Peterson killed any of his victims, he always shouted, I am your father. This is the deadliest attack on a school in Swedish history and also the first deadly attack on a school in Sweden since 1961. This is a crazy case and not many people know about it. So if you want a part 2 with more information just let me know and I'll make it. This is a shocking moment 19 year old Chelsea Standage ignored the pleas of her friends and boyfriend to slow down as she was driving through the streets of Harbury in West Yorkshire at up to 80 miles an hour. Just a quick warning, view discretion is advised. It was the early hours of November 13th, 2021, and Chelsea had been drinking with friends. She was then met by her boyfriend, Elliot, and when they all climbed into Chelsea's Vauxhall Corsa, she was almost two times the drink drive limit. Chelsea started driving faster and faster, and as her friends and boyfriend told her to slow down, she laughed and ignored them. She reached almost 80 miles an hour going through the residential streets of Harbury and as she was going downhill, she clipped a car and ploughed straight into a wall, crushing the passenger side of the car where Elliot was sitting. Elliot didn't stand a chance of survival. Part of his spine was missing in the wreckage. His rib cage had shattered and pierced his vital organs, leaving only his heart intact. Elliot's mum had to go and identify his body and she said, quote, I was begging and begging him to wake up. If I could have put my breath into him to give him my life, I would have done it in a heartbeat. I wanted to swap places with him. When I held his hand and realised he wasn't waking up, I just dropped to the ground. Following Elliot's death, his family's grief was actually made worse by seeing photos and videos of Chelsea out clubbing and drinking while awaiting her trial. They were also absolutely furious that she was allowed to continue driving up until her court date. Chelsea admitted causing death by dangerous driving, as well as two counts of causing serious injury by dangerous driving to her two other passengers. She was sentenced to eight years and eight months in prison,
but she'll be considered for release after serving just two thirds of that sentence. The Funky Town Killers might have another video and I'm about to explain it. The video begins in a well-lit white room with white tiles on the floor. The tiles look extremely identical to the ones in Funky Town. In the opening seconds of the video, one of the killers is holding up a still beating heart to the camera. And while this is happening, you can hear the cameraman laughing hysterically. And you then realize there are multiple cartel members in the room and there are two dead guys lying on the ground. After the opening seconds, the camera goes to one of the victim's corpses on the ground. And since there are two dead victims with their hearts ripped out of their bodies, there is literally blood everywhere. The camera then stays on one of the victim's bodies and one of the cartel members then starts to behead him. And once the beheading was completed, the cartel members began to play soccer with the victim's head. The cameraman gets involved and they all begin kicking the head around having fun. They are laughing, cracking jokes, and it's absolutely sickening. Every time the head is kicked around, you see the blood trail it leaves behind on the white tile floor. After this, they then pose with the head and hold it up to the camera. The camera then pans to the other victim's body on the floor and you can see another cartel member dismembering the victim's arm. You see him slicing away with a knife. The camera then goes back to the other victim's body and you can see that they removed one of his arms. And at this point, one of the cartel members gets down on his knees and begins having an arm wrestle with the severed arm of the victim just laughing. It's absolutely horrible and disturbing and the video then concludes. Now the video doesn't show the killings, but it's safe to assume they were carried out shortly before the video was recorded, since at the beginning of the video there was a beating heart. Now not only is the brutal nature of the video terrifying, but also the setting of it. The setting looks exactly like the setting of the infamous video Funky Town. And many people who saw both videos are convinced it's the same room Funky Town was done in. But nothing at this point is 100% confirmed. But assuming from the gruesome nature of the video, and the white tiles, I do believe this was the same room Funky Town was done in. This video is extremely disturbing and the cartel members laughing, having a good time, while kicking the victim's head around is just something you don't want to see. Please never go searching for this video because you will regret it. Imagine you're sat out on your sun deck near the water having an evening drink, when you suddenly hear a child's voice in the distance screaming help from the water. That's exactly what happened on May 23rd, 2009 in Portland, Oregon. Patty and Dan Gallagher were on the deck of their waterside condo enjoying a drink when they heard something hit the water, followed by a child's voice screaming help me. There wasn't much light on the water, so Dan shouted where are you while Patty dialed 911 and told the operator that someone had fallen from the bridge over the Willamette River. By now, other people had heard the screams and a couple that lived on a floating home on the water motored their boat and set out to find where the voice was coming from. 25 minutes went by when finally Cheryl and David spotted the young girl in the water. Cheryl jumped in and as she was swimming back with the girl, she heard David shout, Oh my God, there's another one. David immediately jumped in the water and grabbed the young boy, only he was silent. He'd been face down in the water for 30 minutes by this point. And although CPR was administered, it was already too late for four-year-old Eldon. His sister, seven-year-old Trinity, was rushed to hospital and the police launched a homicide investigation. They had no idea who these children were or how they'd come to be in the water. Meanwhile, two miles down the river in Milwaukee, Eldon and Trinity's older brother Gavin was at home in bed. He'd decided to stay at home with his grandparents while his mother went to pick up Eldon and Trinity. Only he woke up at 1am and realised that they weren't home, so he woke his grandparents and they tried to call his mother Amanda. They couldn't get hold of her, so they decided to ring Eldon and Trinity's dad, Jason. He told them that Amanda had been round at 8pm and picked the children up. Jason checked his phone and realised that he'd had a missed call from Amanda at 1.22am. He tried to phone her back and it was an hour and a half before he got through. She answered and said, help me. Jason asked where the children were, but Amanda wouldn't tell him, so he phoned the police and said that he thought his two children were in danger. He had absolutely no idea that his four-year-old son Eldon was already dead. Around 7am, Amanda's sister saw on the news that two children had been found in the river. Jason was informed and he phoned the police and told them that he thought the two children in the river might be his. He was then told that his son was dead and his daughter was in a critical condition in hospital. 
By now, police were out looking for Amanda and they found her on the ninth floor of a multi-storey car park. When she saw the police, she ran and tried to jump over the side, but they grabbed her just in time and she was detained. Amanda admitted to throwing her children over the bridge, saying that she did it to hurt Jason. Amanda was charged with aggravated murder and attempted aggravated murder and sentenced to life with a minimum of 35 years. On Sunday the 4th of June 2023, Amanda was found dead in her cell. Her cause of death has not been released. Over 80 bodies have been found in this park over the years. Welcome to Leakin Park in Baltimore, the scariest place in America. So if you've never heard of Leakin Park, this place is famous. It's in the heart of Baltimore, bordered by some of the most dangerous neighborhoods in the city. And this place has been a notorious body dumping ground for years. There have been all sorts of victims of all different sorts of crimes that have happened here. One thing that happens regularly in the park is the dumping of bodies of animals. Now, I've been to the park and I've actually found a couple of dead dogs wrapped up in garbage bags. It's really sad, but the history only gets worse from there. There are a lot of hot spots in Leakin Park where people love to dump bodies, but one right here is nicknamed the Devil's Well. Only a few years ago in 2018, a man was brutally murdered right here. His body was set on fire and it was then dumped down this well. To this day, nobody has ever been arrested in connection to this murder. There was also the murder of Heyman Lee, whose body was found dumped here. She was the subject of the podcast Serial. But it's not just single murders that have happened here. Serial killers have operated inside of this park, including this man, Reginald Vernon Oates. Decades ago, he was found wandering through the park where he had buried four young boys in shallow graves. He was carrying a lunchbox with pieces of the boys inside of it. There's also Lemuel Wallace, who was murdered inside of the park's restroom. A local pastor from Baltimore was actually convicted of hiring a hitman to bring Lemuel out there so that he would be brutally murdered so the pastor could collect life insurance money from him. And this is just a sample of the murders that have happened here. I'm talking 80 different confirmed bodies that have been discovered there. A friend of mine named Dan Bell, who's done a great video series of documentaries on this park, actually found a human skull fragment inside of the park just a few years ago. He called it into the police. He had just been walking through the woods when he came across it, and it ended up being the skull of someone who had taken their own life. There's actually a site dedicated to mapping out where all of the bodies in Leakin Park have been found. As you can see, these are all red dots where corpses have been recovered, and this is only a fraction of the stories. There was a serial killer who brought a woman to Leakin Park to murder her. He cut off her ears, but she eventually fought him off and escaped. There's obviously tons of gang violence and bodies that are just dumped. And on a specific road right here named Winterbourne Avenue, a serial killer has dumped multiple bodies. Winterbourne is the last remaining road that actually goes through Leakin Park. I forgot to mention this at the beginning. Uh, years ago, the city actually closed off most of the inroads that led through Leakin Park because so many bodies were being dumped there. I actually filmed a whole documentary about Leakin Park. It's two and a half hours long. We visited so many of the sites where these bodies have been dumped. We interviewed a bunch of people who had experiences there. And we went there three different times throughout a year to try and investigate if this place was haunted or not. And let me tell you, it was one of the craziest videos I've ever filmed in my life. And the stories of this park are so twisted, so dark, mafia dumping grounds, so many unsolved murders. If you want to watch the full documentary, it's on my YouTube now. The link is in my bio. But warning, it is disturbing. unlikely reason that a trip to Taco Bell ended in murder. It was 2003 in Illinois. Sarah Kolb and Corey Gregory met after being enrolled in a GED program together. They quickly became inseparable as friends. However, Corey was known to have grown romantic feelings for Sarah, but unfortunately for Corey, Sarah was a lesbian and did not feel the same way about him. Sarah was known for being an alpha female in her friendship circle, and she started hanging out with a group called the Juggalos, who I found out are fans of the hip hop group Insane Clown Posse. The group is stereotyped as being violent and crime committing, and in 2011, the FBI would go on to officially label them as a gang. In November 2004, a girl called Adrienne Reynolds moved to East Moline to live with her dad. She was enrolled in the same program as Sarah and Corey and quickly caught Sarah's eye. It's reported that Sarah made her feelings known for Adrienne and the pair began flirting. This went on for a matter of weeks with the pair writing romantic letters to each other when they eventually decided to meet out of school. 
The pair ended up going to a party together and it's believed that Sarah had expectations of how the relationship was going to develop, but it actually all ended up going horribly wrong. She was blindsided when Adrienne left the party and returned a few hours later. Adrienne told Sarah that she had slept with two guys. At this point, Sarah decided to cut things off with Adrienne, but Adrienne wanted the relationship to continue. She wasn't ready to go down without a fight. Over a period of two months, Adrienne relentlessly pursued Sarah for another chance. Sarah actually even ended up making threats to Adrienne if she didn't leave her alone. Now, Adrienne at this point decided to develop a relationship with Corey and she started writing letters to him. Ultimately, Sarah ended up finding out about these letters to Corey and she was enraged. On the 21st of January 2005, Sarah invited Adrienne for lunch. Adrienne was pleased under the impression that they could all maybe finally get along. Unfortunately, she couldn't have been more wrong. After meeting up at Taco Bell, Sarah confronted Adrienne about writing the letters to Corey. A huge fight broke out in the car park of the restaurant. Corey ended up intervening and he actually held Adrienne down while Sarah strangled her to death. The pair then took Adrienne's body to Sarah's grandparents' farm where they tried to burn her with petrol. When that failed, they called a friend of theirs, 16-year-old Nathan, to come and help them. He used his granddad's handsaw to dismember her body and put her body parts in a bin bag. The trio then disposed of her remains at Black Hawk Historical Site in Rock Island. Adrienne's parents started to get really worried when she didn't turn up for work and they reported her missing. Her remains were discovered by police on the 26th of January. Sarah and Corey were charged as adults with two counts of first degree murder and concealment of homicide. Nathan was also charged with concealment of a homicide. Sarah was found guilty and was sentenced to 53 years in prison. Corey was sentenced to 45 years in prison after pleading guilty. Nathan was given a juvenile sentence of five years and he actually died a few years after his release in a car accident. This schoolboy stabbed his teacher to death in front of a classroom full of students. 61-year-old Anne Maguire was a Spanish teacher teaching in Leeds. She'd actually worked at the school for 40 years and she was only five months off retirement. However, in April 2014, something absolutely horrific happened. One of her students was 15-year-old Will Cornick. He'd always been described as a smart student who never really caused any trouble. Classmates regarded him as a polite student, but after he got diagnosed with diabetes, his personality seemed to change. In 2013, he tried to join the army, but because of his diagnosis, he was rejected. Being in the army had been his dream, so this was really upsetting for him. After failing to complete his Spanish homework, he was given detention by Anne. He also expressed a wish to her that he wanted to drop Spanish, but she wouldn't let him, which only angered him more. He began to develop a deep-rooted grudge against Anne. Shockingly, he reportedly messaged his friends on Facebook asking if one of them would kill her for him for £10. During one school day, halfway through his Spanish class, Will decided to get up and attack Anne with a knife. The classmates watched on in horror as he chased her out of the classroom. When there, another teacher heard her screams and tried to shield Anne from any more blows from him. Will then allegedly returned to his class and told his classmates how it was a shame that he hadn't killed her. However, Anne did actually pass away from her injuries. Will later admitted that he did plan also to kill two other teachers. One of them was actually pregnant at the time. He's been sentenced to life in prison with a minimum of 20 years. This mysterious case absolutely does not sit right with me. Someone knows something and has not come forward. On the 12th of July 2015, 18-year-old Tiffany and her parents attended a graduation party in New Jersey. At around 9pm, one of Tiffany's friends spoke to her parents and claimed that they were really annoyed because Tiffany had used their debit card without permission. Tiffany initially denied this to her friend, but then did admit this to her mum Diane a little bit later. At this point, they were all outside Tiffany's house and Diane went inside to find her husband. When she returned outside of the house, Tiffany had vanished. Now, they were able to see Tiffany on the deer cameras that they had outside the house. She appears to be walking down the driveway in her normal clothing and white headband. When they tried to find Tiffany, they actually made a terrifying discovery. Her phone was lying on the floor at the bottom of the driveway. Immediately, they knew something was wrong as Tiffany never had her phone out of her sight. At 11.30 p.m., her family called the police. Little did they know, 27 minutes earlier, Tiffany had been hit by a train. 
Frustratingly, pretty much straight away, police presumed this death to be a self-unaliving. However, that just didn't seem to fit with the evidence presented. All of Tiffany's family and friends said how much of an upbeat person she was and that she was really happy at the time. She was making plans for the future and the autopsy also showed that she had a clean toxicology report. Now in the deer cam footage, she was fully clothed, but when she was found, she was just in her underwear with no shoes on. Upsettingly, two weeks after her death, Tiffany's mum actually found her missing trainers and headband more than a mile away from the track. Could someone have murdered Tiffany and then dumped her body on the train tracks to make it look like she did this herself? Tiffany's parents certainly think so. They definitely suspect some foul play was involved. the disturbing case of the child who killed a child. In July 2018, six-year-old Alicia McPhail was abducted from her bed. She'd been staying with her grandparents in the Isle of Butte. She'd gone to sleep watching Peppa Pig and no one had any idea of the horrors that would unfold that evening. Meanwhile, 16-year-old Aaron Campbell was drinking with friends at his house. Aaron apparently became upset in the night because he had been arguing with his mum. He had had a challenging upbringing involving physical and emotional abuse. Aaron decided that that evening he wanted to get some substances to smoke from a couple that he knew. The couple in question were Alicia's dad, Robert, and his girlfriend. They'd been known to sell substances to Aaron previously, but he could not get hold of them. Intending to go and steal them off them, Aaron armed himself with a knife. He headed to Robert's house where he lived with his parents and girlfriend. This was obviously where Alicia was staying that evening. When he arrived at the house, he noticed the six-year-old sleeping in her bed and took the opportunity to snatch the poor defenseless young child. Disgustingly, he carried her to a secluded location, essayed her and then killed her. He then disposed of his clothes in the sea. At 6am the next day, Alicia's grandparents woke up to discover that the little girl was missing. They straight away alerted police and locals. When the family asked Aaron to keep an eye out for the little girl, he texted them back saying, oh damn, I'm sure she's not went too far. A local man soon discovered Alicia's lifeless body around 15 minutes away from her house. Along with a lot of the local community, Aaron's mum actually checked her CCTV of her house. She was hoping that this would help with the investigation and it definitely did. She saw her son leaving and returning from the house that night and she handed the evidence over to police. Aaron was arrested and it was discovered that the clothes that he'd abandoned on the beach did actually match with his DNA. This case made me terrified to go to the cinema. This is the case of the horror in Screen 9. James Holmes was raised in California. His mum was a nurse and his dad was a scientist. From a young age, he was experiencing night terrors and allegedly actually tried to take his own life when he was just 11 years old. He was apparently obsessed with guns and weapons and had dreamed of becoming a mass murderer. Between May and July 2012, he legally bought four guns. Background checks were conducted and he was allowed the weapons. He also bought spike strips, which if you don't know, pop the tires of cars if they chase after you. On July the 19th, just hours before tragedy would unfold, James mailed his notebook to his psychiatrist. Inside the notebook, James detailed his plans to kill. The notebook was actually discovered later on undelivered. Just prior to entering a cinema in Aurora, James rang a crisis line to tell them about his plans to kill. However, the call was disconnected after just nine seconds. At the midnight showing of The Dark Knight Rises, CCTV captures James walking into the cinema. He walks into screen nine, props open the door and then walks back out again. Shockingly, he goes to his car and gets guns out and gas canisters. He re-entered the screen at about 12.38 p.m. and set off two gas canisters. When he entered screen nine again, he immediately opens fire on the audience, instantly killing 10 people. Two others later died in hospital from their injuries. An additional 70 people were injured. This was an absolutely packed out cinema. 
James also shot at people as they scrambled to exit the screen. His youngest victim was a six-year-old girl. Witnesses said this all unfolded as there was actually a gunfight on the screen and initially they all thought it was special effects and just part of the film. Police were actually on the scene very quickly after the first 911 call. James surrendered to the police and was arrested in the car park. He was apparently very, very calm when he was arrested and told police that he had booby trapped his apartment. When police investigated his apartment, this was found out to be true. He was sentenced to 12 consecutive life sentences.